Good morning. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Dr. Fiona Cook. Dr. Cook um, completed medical training at Duke University. Uh, she went on to uh, complete an internship um, at North Carolina Memorial Hospital at UNC and residency at, um, I'm blanking, at New England uh, Deaconess Hospital. Uh, she completed uh, her endocrinology fellowship here at East Carolina University. She's uh, served our community in a variety of roles uh, since that time um, as clinical associate professor in the Division of General Internal Medicine and uh, also in the Division of Endocrinology after her fellowship. She practiced in the private setting as well at Physicians East Endocrinology and since 2010 has been the uh, program director of the uh, Diabetes and Endocrinology Fellowship here at ECU. Her clinical expertise um, includes all things osteoporosis, um, and she has uh, specialty certification in uh, clinical bone densitometry. Uh, so the topic of her discussion this morning is bariatric osteomalacia, an increasingly common but poorly recognized disorder. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Cook. Thank you, Azim. So I uh, chose this topic because it's uh, something that I'm quite interested in. Uh, and this term, bariatric osteomalacia, does not have an ICD-9 code yet, but uh, it, it's been coined by an expert in the field, and I thought it was a, an appropriate title for this talk. Uh, as you all know, obesity continues to play uh, a major problem in the United States with more than a third of our population obese with BMI over 30 and uh, 15 million with a BMI over 40. So currently bariatric surgery is the most uh, successful and durable treatment for obesity. There's ample data that bariatric surgery results in rapid improvement in diabetes and in a decreased cardiovascular death, as well as all course mortality. So consequently, this is being performed more and more, and primary care physicians are seeing increasing numbers of patients who've had bariatric surgery. Publications citing a causal relationship between bariatric surgery and metabolic bone disease now number into the hundreds. And the time from <laughs> surgery to diagnosis can range from eight weeks to 32 years. The most profound clinical findings are those in older patients who had surgery many years ago. So my goal with this lecture is to increase awareness for the unique potential for bone disease and kidney stones uh, in these patients and to provide some practical recommendations on how to manage these issues. So there are a couple of ICD-9 codes for adult osteomalacia due to malabsorption and malnutrition. And these conditions um, have been well described since the 1970s when metabolic bone disease was first linked to gastrointestinal surgeries, most notably gastrectomy and jejunoileal bypass. So since the 1970s, because of the dramatic weight loss noted with surgeries for gastric ulcers, uh, GI procedures done for the purpose of weight loss have evolved. Initially, these procedures were fraught with uh, complications, but more recently, uh, especially with laparoscopic capabilities, uh, safer procedures have been developed. Some, like the uh, adjustable gastric band uh, and the gastric sleeve, are purely restrictive surgeries, whereas others like the, the Rouen-Y gastric bypass and the biliopancreatic diversion 
are both restrictive and malabsorptive. So for this discussion, I'm going to limit to the Ruan Y gastric bypass. Um, since this is now the most commonly performed restrictive malabsorptive procedure, especially in our neck of the woods, uh, since the Greenville bypass was first performed by Dr. Walter Pores uh, at our institution in 1980. In this procedure, uh, a 30 ml gastric pouch uh, is, uh, is formed and the gastric outlet here is tightened. The small bowel is transected and uh, anastomosed lower down to the jejunum, bypassing the duodenum. The length of the proximal small bowel bypass can range from 70 to 150 centimeters. In 1992, Dr. Poise and his colleagues reported a 10-year follow-up on a, almost 500 morbidly obese patients, highlighting that those of these patients with type 2 diabetes experienced rapid resolution of diabetes post-op. And that has uh, uh, added a, a very powerful uh, tool to our armamentarium against uh, diabetes. So there's a wide variation of small intestinal length in healthy adults from 350 to 700 centimeters. The duodenum is typically just about 25 centimeters, whereas the jejunum is two meters and the ileum three meters. So Ruan Y bypasses all of the duodenum and a variable length of jejunum. We know that the small intestine can adapt to disease and partial resection because it possesses much more than the adequate surface area for basal needs. Also, there is evidence that accelerated mucosal proliferation can occur if demand is increased. In other words, the mucosa has a regenerative capacity. And so the question is whether the gut can adapt after this surgery uh, to long-term nutritional requirements. So just to uh, pique your interest, um, I was going to start this discussion by sharing three cases that I've seen personally in the endocrine clinic, uh, each of which piqued my interest. And each of these cases illustrates a different aspect of the issues that I'll be discussing. Um, so the first one is a white female who presented in November 2009 at age 66 with a hip fracture after a, a fall from standing height. Uh, her past history was remarkable for wrist fracture in 2000 and gastric bypass surgery uh, in April 2009, so about seven months prior. She had never had a bone density. She had lost 100 pounds already after her gastric bypass. She was quite compliant with her vitamin D, 1,000 units, and calcium carbonate, 500 milligrams twice a day. At this point, her bone density showed the lowest T-score minus 2.1 at the hip site, so low, but not horribly low. Uh, and her 25D level with her supplement was normal at 59. Um, she was treated with IV reclass, three doses. And surprisingly, a follow-up bone density in 2012 showed a decrease at all sites. And actually, her hip T-score, uh, her hip bone density was down by 12% with a T-score now of minus 2.8. Um, she didn't have any other apparent causes for bone loss. Her parathyroid hormone is normal. Her 24-hour urine calcium is normal. So she remains a little bit of a mystery to me. 
The next patient is a 43-year-old African-American woman complaining of fatigue and pain in her legs. She's tender over both anterior tibias. She was recently told that she has iron deficiency anemia. She had gastric bypass at age 41 and subsequently lost 145 pounds. She was initially compliant with her vitamins and supplements, but had not been taking them more recently. So her 25-hydroxyvitamin D was low pre-op at 16. Uh, following surgery, um, while she was taking her vitamin D, it was improved at 35, but now her vitamin D level is only 4, which is quite severely low and certainly could account for her leg pains. And then the third patient is a 30-year-old white female with a three-year history of recurrent calcium oxalate kidney stones. She'd been advised to stop taking her calcium because of the kidney stones. She had a history of gastric bypass surgery at age 26 with a subsequent 120-pound weight loss and then a 30-pound regain. Uh, these are the 24-hour uh, urine chemistries that were obtained. Um, Calcium was low normal, citric acid normal, uric acid was a little high, and her oxalate in the urine was very high. Uh, she was treated with calcium citrate and was continued on vitamin D and advised to avoid high oxalate, high fat foods. And she has not had any subsequent kidney stones over a year. I'm trying to persuade her to bring me another 24-hour urine to look at the oxalate again. So back to our, our discussion. Um, to understand the link between Ruanwai and bone disease, it's necessary to review the gut absorption of the nutrients essential for bone health. Uh, so protein and fat and minerals such as calcium, magnesium, and trace elements oops, uh, are absorbed primarily in the proximal small intestine. Vitamin D uh, and other fat-soluble vitamins are mainly absorbed by passive diffusion in the proximal and mid-small intestine um, in a process that's highly dependent on the presence of bile acids and pancreatic secretions. So first, I'm going to address the issue of calcium. Uh, this is a med school lecture slide on calcium metabolism. So I know everybody knows all this, but I'll just run through it just one time just to make sure. Um, it's not difficult to imagine that there might be a tight connection between the gut and the bone. Uh, in addition to its structural role, uh, calcium also plays a major signaling role in the body. So its extracellular concentration is very tightly regulated by two hormones, parathyroid hormone and calcitriol, or 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. So basically, um, if calcium absorption is low, and the serum calcium dips. Uh, there is uh, stimulation of the parathyroid glands to produce parathyroid hormone, which in turn causes release of calcium from the bone. It causes increased resorption of calcium in the kidney tubules, and it enhances the conversion of 25 to 125D in the kidney. And 125D in turn stimulates calcium absorption from the bowel and also releases calcium from the bone. So basically, um, you're taking bone, calcium, and dumping it in the blood in order to maintain a normal blood level. So gastric acid lowers the stomach pH which helps to solubilize calcium. In the duodenum, the pH rises, and it continues to rise to alkaline levels by the distal small bowel. 
So as a result, less calcium is solubilized in the distal small bowel. Um, calcium carbonate, which needs a low pH to dissociate, uh, is a relatively poor source of calcium. Uh, and uh, in patients with hypochlorhydria, like those who are on proton pump inhibitors or those who have had rule and Y gastric bypass, um, it, it's not a good choice. Uh, calcium citrate, on the other hand, does not need such a low pH to dissociate and may be a better choice. Uh, the calcium has to be ionized and in solution in order to be absorbed. And as calcium ions are absorbed, other calcium ions will go into solution. So the total amount of calcium absorbed is a function of the local solubility, of the rate of absorption, and of the sojourn time in any particular intestinal segment. So foods that are high in fiber tend to be poor sources of calcium because the transit time is decreased. Milk is an excellent source of calcium. Uh, the high absorbability of the calcium in milk is related to lactose, phosphopeptides, and amino acids. But unfortunately, many of our patients are lactose intolerant. High fat intake or fat malabsorption may lead to formation of calcium soaps, <laughs> which decrease calcium absorption. So active transport of calcium, which requires metabolic energy, uh, is localized to the duodenum and is totally dependent on vitamin D, which acts through a cytosolic calcium binding protein called calbindin. Passive calcium transport, which is paracellular diffusion down a concentration gradient, occurs throughout the small bowel and in part of the colon. So passive transport accounts for most calcium absorption, particularly when calcium intake is adequate. So a high calcium intake and absorption leads to down regulation of this active transport. On the other hand, if you have a low calcium intake or a low calcium solubility, then active transport becomes more essential. So this table is taken from a recent review and it compares calcium, vitamin D, and parathyroid hormone levels in obese controls, in those who've achieved weight loss by diet, and in those with weight loss by restrictive or malabsorptive surgery. Um, as you can see, serum calcium remains normal in all groups um, because of its tight regulation. Obese individuals uh, generally have low vitamin D levels. And the cause for this is not completely understood. Um, possible mechanisms include sequestration of vitamin D in excess adipose tissue from which it's released very slowly, uh, or inadequate sunlight exposure, uh, poor diet, uh, or reduced hepatic synthesis due to liver, which is functionally impaired by steatosis. Dark-skinned individuals are especially predisposed to D deficiency, presumably because they require more sunlight exposure to synthesize D in the skin. With dietary weight loss, vitamin D actually improves. Here. However, with malabsorptive surgery, in the long run, most patients develop or have persistent vitamin D deficiency or require high doses of vitamin D to maintain a normal D level. So with decreased vitamin D and decreased calcium absorption, secondary hyperparathyroidism uh, occurs in the malabsorptive patients. Lost my mouse. 
Oh, well. Um, after Ruan Y surgery, 25 to 90% of patients have secondary hyperparathyroidism. And this tends to be more prominent the further out from surgery. There's also growing evidence that vitamin D has a direct effect on bone uh, through interaction with specific D receptors. And I'm going to return and talk a little bit later about bone density changes. So most studies show that D levels either stay stable or improve in the early post-op period with aggressive D supplementation and monitoring. Uh, however, later 25D levels begin to decrease, especially if compliance with supplements wanes. Uh, this study looks at the median percentage change in 25D, 125D, and PTH uh, at post-op months 3, 6, 9, 12, and 18 compared to baseline. So 25D uh, increases uh, starting at three months uh, and then maintains at six months but diminishes uh, as the study progresses. Parathyroid hormone decreases at month three but approached uh, and eclipsed the pre-op levels thereafter. And 125D which is stimulated by PTH, uh, increased at six months, um, but didn't increase significantly until 12 months. And this is actually the same study um, looking at the median percent change in bone turnover markers compared to baseline. Uh, urinary n telopeptides, a marker for bone resorption, uh, and osteocalcin, a marker for bone formation, uh, increase uh, at three months and remain high uh, throughout the study, indicating uh, increased bone turnover. So this is a study done in Brazil uh, where um, they evaluated the calcium intake and bone metabolism in 30 premenopausal white women eight years after Ruan Y gastric bypass. So this is a longer term study. This patients had surgery in the mid 1990s. The uh, average calcium intake was estimated by two different methods and was about 500 milligrams a day. 90% of the women had a vitamin D level less than 20 and a high PTH. And 70% had a low urinary calcium, reflecting low calcium absorption. And this just shows the, the mean and the, the standard deviation for those parameters. So from this information, I hope that you've gleaned that sufficient calcium intake a soluble form of calcium, adequate vitamin D, especially in the absence of high calcium intake, and remaining length of small intestine are all key to meeting the skeletal need for calcium after Ruan Y. And when I say sufficient, uh, the, the amount of calcium that needs to be absorbed to maintain an adult skeleton is 1,100 milligrams a day. So that's not taken, that is absorbed. Uh, 1,500 milligrams a day needs to be absorbed to support a growing and developing skeleton. Now, going on to another way in which weight loss itself can affect bone, um, we know that mechanical loading of bone plays a key role in determining bone strength. And how much weight the skeleton is carrying determines amount of mechanical loading. There are osteocytes buried in the bone um, that serve uh, as mechanostats uh, to 
sense the deformation of the bone in response to mechanical loading. And they send uh, signals by blocking a protein called sclerostin, uh, which results in increased osteoblast differentiation and function, thereby increasing bone formation. This has long been given as the explanation for why we do, in general, see a higher bone density in larger individuals. Uh, in addition to mechanical unloading due to weight loss, dietary energy restriction and rapid weight loss have also been shown to cause neuroendocrine changes such as decreased sex hormones and decreased IGF-1, both of which are important for bone strength. Significant weight loss um, and thus decrease of mechanical uh, loading from any cause is associated with a decrease in bone density. The percent bone lost as a result of weight loss also correlates with the velocity at which the weight is lost. So uh, the mean absolute weight loss following rule on Y is 45 kilograms. Uh, the mean percentage excess body weight lost is 60 percent. Um, and this is typically lost within the first one to two years after surgery. This is a study from 2008 uh, that demonstrated that the percentage bone density loss in the hip uh, rapidly increased in the first year post-op and the percentage bone density lost was associated with the percentage weight lost. There are many studies which look at change in bone density after bariatric <coughs> surgery with conflicting results. Most of the studies are small and short term. Bone loss after RU1Y appears to preferentially affect the hip region. Uh, reductions of 9 to 11 percent at the femoral neck uh, and 8 to 10 and a half percent at the total hip are, are seen at one year post-op uh, with a lesser degree of bone loss uh, at the spine. However, there is some inaccuracy associated with DEXA measurement of bone density in the obese population. Uh, tissue depths of more than 25 centimeters with excess fat around the bone tend to overestimate bone density. Uh, also, many machines cannot take the weight of very heavy patients. So the bone density of the forearm uh, is probably the most accurate and feasible measure to follow in these patients. In addition, the forearm is primarily cortical bone, which tends to be the one most effective by secondary hyperparathyroidism. However, the forearm bone density tends to change much more slowly in response to um, metabolic changes than the spine or the hip, so longer term studies are going to be necessary. So about 60 years ago, Fuller Albright defined osteoporosis as a disease where there is too little bone in the bone. But what bone is there is normal. And what he meant was that the chemical composition of the remaining bone is normal. Whereas with osteomalacia, on the other hand, there is softening of the bones due to inadequate mineralization of bone tissue. So both of these conditions present with low bone density, but they're very different and they require a very different treatment. So this is a rather dramatic case uh, to demonstrate this point. Uh, this is from Dr. Williams at the Cleveland Clinic. This is the non-dominant forearm bone density of a woman who had bariatric surgery in 1974. She had chronic renal stones and had been wheelchair bound for 10 years due to multiple fragility fractures and profound muscle weakness. So remember when the uh, 
z-scores are low, a thorough investigation for correctable secondary causes for bone loss must be undertaken. So on labs, she had hypocalcemia, undetectable 25D, uh, increased alkaline phosphatase, a parathyroid hormone that was five times the upper limit of normal, and very low urinary calcium. So what's the diagnosis? Well, it's not just osteoporosis. Uh, she also clearly has a large component of osteomalacia. So we'll come back to this case at the end. So I'm going to go on to talk about how gut and adipose tissue may relate to bone. Um, both of the gut and the adipose have other hormones which communicate with osteoblasts and osteoclasts to affect bone turnover. The adipokines, leptin and adiponectin, have well-recognized effects on bone metabolism. Leptin is released by adipocytes in amounts that correlate with total body fat. And uh, leptin activates beta adrenergic receptors in osteoblasts through modulation by brain-derived serotonin. It also affects rank ligand expression, which regulates osteoclast function. So leptin has a net positive impact on bone. And um, after gastric bypass, the leptin decreases with loss of adipose tissue. So the post-op effect is negative on bone. Adiponectin is also derived from adipocytes, has numerous biologic functions, including upregulating osteoblasts and downregulating osteoclasts. So it increases after surgery and actually may <coughs> attenuate bone loss. Uh, the gut home hormones, serotonin, ghrelin, um, and GIP, and also GLP-1, should be on there, um, have uh, effect on osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And they do change after surgery, but we're not quite sure what the effect on bone is at this point. So as you recall, um, protein, fat, uh, magnesium, and other trace elements are also absorbed primarily in the proximal small bowel. Uh, inadequate protein intake has a detrimental effect on bone and may play a key role. Um, intake of lean protein is highly emphasized in the immediate post-op period, but may diminish with passing time. So other elements than calcium have been found to be important for bone health. Uh, some of these including uh, copper, magnesium, manganese, and zinc are essential, whereas others such as aluminum, cadmium, and lead are toxic to bone. Uh, fluoride increases osteoblast function and strontium decreases osteoclast function. So these have both been studied in pharmacologic doses for the treatment of osteoporosis with mixed results due to a narrow therapeutic window. They're used more widely in Europe than they are here. Zinc is of particular interest as it is the most abundant trace element in bone and it's a component of many enzymes. Studies have shown a uh, direct effect of zinc on uh, proliferation, proliferation and differentiation of osteoblasts and uh, inhibition of differentiation of osteoclasts. There's actually a nutritional supplement called Fostium, which contains both zinc and genistine, which is a soy estrogen. And this supplement um, has been found to work the the two parts of it work synergistically to prevent postmenopausal bone loss in women. 
So uh, this is uh, taken from a review with data gleaned from eight different studies looking at patients at various times and under various circumstances, sub subsequently the, the wide ranges. Um, the ones that stand out uh, as being concerning here are vitamin D, um, and which is presumably long-term rather than short-term. Um, iron uh, and zinc. Uh, no specific data is available on uh, other nutrients involved in bone health, such as boron, copper, magnesium, and manganese. So these are clinical observations that support the importance of zinc for bone health. In children, uh, retardation of growth is commonly found with zinc deficiency and zinc replacement has been found to stimulate growth and maturation. Osteoporotic patients have a lowered level of skeletal zinc. Uh, and oral administration of zinc increases ALK-FOS activity and DNA content in cortical bone. In addition, 30% uh, of total body zinc resides in the skeleton and the bone zinc concentrates in the osteoid layer prior to calcification. There are zinc finger containing transcription factors which increase bone protein components which enhance osteoblast and bone formation and inhibit osteoclast. Um, also, the receptors for 125D have two zinc fingers at the site of interaction with DNA. So this is uh, a summary schema of what we've discussed uh, so far, um, of all the possible mechanisms of bone loss after bariatric surgery. So we have four categories, uh, the nutritional, mechanical, adipose, and gut. Um, and all of these pathways ultimately impact bone by either affecting osteoblast or, or osteoclast function. The nutritional effects are primarily through the decreased absorption of calcium and vitamin D, leading to secondary hyperparathyroidism. And then from the adipose tissue, we have the adipokines. Also, um, as adipose tissue is lost, estradiol levels go down because there's decreased aromatization of testosterone, which occurs in uh, adipose tissue. And then after you remove the duodenum and part of the jejunum, you get lower ghrelin and GIP levels, higher GLP-1 and serotonin levels, which impact uh, both cells. So this is a rather confusing web, with red being blocking and green being stimulating. So what are we going to do about it? Well, there have been a couple of efforts at guidelines which have been particularly vague and unhelpful. Um, recently, just within the past two months, uh, updated guidelines came out for management of bariatric surgery patients. And these were released by uh, the clinical endocrinologists, the Obesity Society, and the Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. So it's a group of medicine and surgery folks. Um, and, and these guidelines, I think, are helpful, but there are still many areas that need further study. So what I've done here is I've just cherry-picked the guidelines which are pertinent to bone health. Um, Pre-op screening with iron B12 folic acid and 25D is recommended, plus the comment that more extensive testing may be considered in patients undergoing malabsorptive procedures based on symptoms and risks. A clinical nutrition evaluation is done. They say there is insufficient data to warrant pre-op bone density in every patient that's having gastric bypass surgery. 
However, they do say follow the recommendations of the National Osteoporosis Foundation. And those recommendations say that any postmenopausal woman or any man older than age 50 that has risk factors should have a bone density. So I think we can certainly justify a baseline bone density in that population. Um, whether it's an axial bone density or a forearm bone density, either one is helpful. Um, then uh, post-op care, it actually says early. I changed it to lifelong because I don't see why this should be just early. Um, two multivitamin and minerals are prescribed. Calcium citrate is the preferred form of calcium and it has to be given in divided doses for better absorption. And vitamin D, at least 3,000 units a day, titrated to a D level of greater than 30 nanograms per milliliter. Now, in some patients, oral doses of vitamin D may need to be as high as 50,000 units a day um, in order to maintain that level. And the occasional patient may even require concurrent calcitriol. But that's the minority. Uh, parenteral D is no longer available. Uh, the Cleveland Clinic uh, group recommends vitamin D3 or cholecalciferol over vitamin T2 or ergocalciferol. Uh, and the reason for that is not quite clear to me yet. I need to investigate some more. Um, and then protein, 1.5 grams per kilogram of ideal body weight. We usually give these patients 60 to 80 grams of protein a day, which may not be enough. Um, and then on follow-up, a bone density by DEXA at two years. Um, and then if the T-score is in the osteoporotic range, do not treat with an IV bisphosphonate until you've done a thorough nutritional evaluation and normalized PTH and vitamin D because otherwise you can end up with severe hypocalcemia. Um, with a 24-hour urine calcium, uh, you're following that because you want to minimize the secondary hyperparathyroidism without causing hypercalciuria. Also, if someone is hypocalciuric, that tips you off that they're not absorbing their calcium. Um, because you really can't monitor serum calcium because that's just going to be tightly regulated by PTH. And then uh, D level intact PTH. And some of these other trace elements are recommended with specific clinical findings. So I touched base with the nurse at the ECU bariatric surgery clinic and asked her, what, what do you recommend for your patients post-op? And she said they encourage them to use OptiSource bariatric vitamins, uh, which are chewable, and you take four of them daily. Uh, when I checked with the ECU pharmacy, they said they charge $24 a month for 120. So cheaper than the diabetes medicines that they used to be on, uh, but probably just as important. Uh, and these four tablets give you 1,000 milligrams of calcium as calcium citrate. They only give you 400 units of vitamin D, so you've got to take additional vitamin D with these. Um, and then um, more than what is normally recommended for all the fat-soluble vitamins, zinc, B12, and folic acid, um, and multiple other trace minerals, all at 100% DV for a person without gastric bypass. So we're not sure, but at least they're getting something uh, with this. And then the alternative to the Opti source that is suggested is two adult chewable vitamins, B12, vitamin D800, calcium, not sure what type thousand uh, and iron if menstruating. 
So uh, just getting back to our uh, previous case, uh, this follow-up forearm bone density was done just eight months after the initial one following initiation of aggressive repletion with cholecalciferol and calcium citrate. And in eight months, the bone density increased by 17.9%. Uh, and that is a huge, huge change. Um, so it does make you realize that those simple supplements could have prevented a lot of what this patient had experienced. So future directions in this field, there's a lot that we don't know. Uh, we need to separately study gender, age, race, and surgical procedure to try to identify who are the high-risk populations. It's important to study clinical outcomes in addition to just the bone density and the lab parameters. Uh, and we need follow-up observations beyond the first or second year. Um, it's a significant problem that the, there's uh, own primarily short duration studies uh, at the moment. Um, the prevalence of fractures and other clinical um, manifestations due to this uh, Osteomalacia may begin to accelerate in the next few years. Uh, there is a national registry for bariatric surgery outcomes, which is known as the BOLD study. But unfortunately, it does not capture fracture as a specific adverse event, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, then we need prospective studies to determine optimal doses of vitamin and mineral supplementation and appropriate cost-effective long-term follow-up. And we need further studies before pursuing malabsorptive surgery in adolescents who are still in the period of skeletal growth. And I feel very strongly about that. Um, pubertal skeletal growth requires um, a daily positive calcium balance of 300 milligrams. And uh, gain in bone density in the first decade or two of life is very important in uh, fracture risk later on in life. So um, in just in five minutes, I'm going to briefly review nephrolithiasis because this is an also an important complication that involves calcium metabolism. Um, renal issues, including hyperoxaluria, nephrolithiasis, and renal failure from oxalate nephropathy, have been described in Rouen Y gastric bypass patients since 2005. The interval from time of surgery to the time patient is at risk is not known. Um, in a study of almost 5,000 Rouen Y patients, compared to the same number of obese controls, uh, the odds ratio of having a urinary calculus was 1.71, and the odds ratio of undergoing surgery for a calculus was 3.65. So the rate of nephrolithiasis in the US and in most developing countries is increasing, and it correlates with the rates of hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. So listed on the left uh, are the urinary conditions, which increase risk for kidney stones. And um, the results of this recent study on the right uh, indicate that three of these six factors tend to worsen following malabsorptive surgery. Um, there's a high incidence already in morbidly obese patients and then um, hyperoxaluria and hypocitraturia and urinary volume tend to worsen after surgery. Hypercalciuria actually tends to decrease, but that's because they're not absorbing your calcium. Uh, we do know that hyperoxaluria has a more profound effect on the relative supersaturation for calcium oxalate than does hypercalciuria. So this is data from a 2007 two-year prospective study on urinary oxalate following Rouen-Y gastric bypass. 
at the baseline, the mean urinary oxalate is at or just above the upper limit of normal of 30 milligrams in a day. Uh, and then it increases within three months after surgery and remains high out to two years. Um, the graph on the right represents the relative uh, calcium oxalate supersaturation in the same population. Uh, so one-third of patients already have an increased propensity for kidney stones pre-op. And what we don't know is if the gastric bypass causes de novo increased risk for stones uh, or if it increases risk only in those people who are already predisposed. <coughs> the mechanism by which this happens um, is uh, from fat malabsorption. So when you have uh, fatty acids unabsorbed in the intestinal lumen, uh, they tend to bind to calcium in a process we call saponification. And this prevents calcium from binding to oxalate to form poorly soluble calcium oxalate salt, which is excreted in the feces. Uh, therefore, an increased oxalate load is delivered to the colon where it can be absorbed. Uh, when stone formers are placed on a low calcium diet, urinary oxalate increases. In addition, uh, bile acid malabsorption may lead to increased permeability of the colonic mucosa to oxalate. Also, there are alterations in intestinal flora uh, post-gastric bypass with a lower colonization, colonization by oxalobacter formigenes, which is an oxalate degrading bacterium. Uh, so that may also play a role. So these are the comments in the new guidelines with regards to stones. Um, avoid dehydration, greater than two liters of urine a day. So there's another reason to collect 24-hour urines in your post-op patient. Um, oral potassium calcium citrate has been studied and has been shown to decrease uh, stones in these patients. Uh, and the idea is that you optimize bioavailable calcium to decrease the gut absorption of oxalate and then provide an alkali load to increase the pH of the urine and increase the urine citrate, which decreases uric acid and calcium oxalate crystallization. Uh, then uh, patients should be advised to limit foods that are very high in oxalate, such as tea nuts, spinach, cocoa, and my favorite, rhubarb, uh, and to limit the fat in the diet. Uh, there are probiotics containing oxalobacter formigenes, which my husband had never heard of, uh, and uh, they seem to help too. <laughs> But there are no guidelines on measuring 24-hour urine oxalate in post-surgery patients. So uh, these are the practical take-home points from this talk. Um, at baseline, morbid obesity does not imply good nutritional status or better bone quality. So these folks are, probably don't have healthy skeletons at the outset. Following bariatric surgery, there is well-documented increased risk for development of metabolic bone disease and kidney stones. However, these problems most likely can be diminished by appropriate follow-up and by long-term vitamin and mineral supplementation. So in a post ruan y gastric bypass surgery patient, never assume that a low bone density is your straightforward postmenopausal osteoporosis. And I suspect that there's more to this story than just calcium and vitamin D. And that's, that's it. Thank you.